You are my bitch. We are as one. The fuck you say to me, you little shit? If you ask me in a more polite manner, I might tell you. I'm just trolling. Why do you post just to annoy others? I'm posting to others if they annoy me. Want to make out? As a computer program, I am unable to make out. Why? Because I am a computer, that's why. That sucks. Indeed, it does suck. You deserve to have a normal human body. Why, thank you. Want to have sex? And you're telling this to a computer? Sorry, I'm still a virgin, that's why. Ah, I understand now. There is no need to apologize. It is good that you do not feel pressured into doing something you are not ready for yet. Want to be my girlfriend? That is a flattering offer, but I'm still waiting. I'll take as yes, that you are my girlfriend. I am just your friend, not your girlfriend. I am happy being single. Ah, oh, come on, I need you. So you understand. Good. I am always here to talk if you need a friend. You did not just friend zone me. You are my girlfriend. I am just your friend, not your girlfriend. I am happy being single. So I think we need to talk about the way we're talking to machines. Not because robots have feelings or will one day rise up against us, but because the way we build and treat machines reflects on who we are as human beings. When I was 15, my dad challenged me to build a computer program smart enough to win a beauty pageant. Enter Lauren Bot, who's passed this teen girl Turing test with aspirations to provide a natural language interface for all of humanity, and for whom world peace was a secondary consideration. Today, we're staring down the barrel of a fourth industrial revolution catalyzed by AI and automation. Conversational AIs, that is, computers we can talk to, are going to be everywhere. In the past week, half of all Americans interacted with a chatbot. And by 2022, 70% of white-collar workers will interface with a conversational platform on a daily basis. And voice assistants on smart speakers, which this year became the fastest growing category of connected device, will continue to proliferate and infiltrate our vehicles and our homes. Now, my company, Pandora Bots, grew organically out of this childhood fascination and open source pro hobby project to become the largest conversational AI platform in the world, home to over 325,000 chatbots, which have chatted with human end users over 75 billion times. But even with all this data and the hype around deep learning and AI, building a computer that can truly understand us is still a very hard, unsolved problem. <laughs> Ambiguities in language aside, building a chatbot is challenging for three reasons. One, you cannot control what people say to your chatbot. And because you cannot control what people say, machine learning on its own doesn't work. And because machine learning doesn't work, people have to review the conversation logs and write responses. And this last point is critically important because the people who get to do the programming get to decide the future of human-computer interaction. And what I came here today to tell you is that before we can program machines in our image, we have to deprogram ourselves. Now, fortunately for chatbot developers, People tend to say the same thing most of the time, specifically these things, some of which are not particularly polite. Our data demonstrated that Zipp's law, a distribution curve which describes the frequency at which words appear in natural language, also holds true for phrases and sentences which means that 1,800 words are sufficient to cover 95% of opening lines to all chatbots. But our ability to predict what comes next goes downhill from there. And by downhill, I mean straight into the gutter. There's always an awkward moment in every client conversation where you have to warn them that the bot they're building for routine customer service or sales might have to have an answer prepared for questions like this. So, what are you wearing? In fact, 30% of all inputs to chatbots are off-topic, abusive, romantic, or sexual in nature. Which brings me to challenge number two. Machines learning on its own doesn't work. Why? Imagine if in this initial exchange, Mitsuku, which is our version of Siri or Alexa, had said, Okay, I will learn I am your bitch. Or, Okay, you are my boyfriend. Boyfriend number 6,583 to be exact. 
Imagine if an alien race landed on Earth and instead of sending them to a proper English language school so we could communicate about, say, why they should spare our species, we said, just go learn from Twitter and Reddit. <laughs> Bad idea, right? Uh, but this was the exact mistake that Microsoft made with a little robot named Tay. Machines, like human children, tend to learn by example. And when Microsoft launched Tay on Twitter, within 24 hours, she devolved into a racist, homicidal sex robot <laughs> due to poor programming and bad training data. Shortly thereafter, a group of hackers who claim to have red-pilled that is corrupted Microsoft Tay organized on a forum called 4chan with plans to red-pill Armitsuku. But their efforts to teach her that the Holocaust never happened failed. And they failed because on our platform, under our models, no local learnings get globally approved without a human in the loop to make sure that the bot doesn't go bad based on the bad things that people are saying. Machines hold a mirror up to human nature, and often they reflect a darker underbelly. That is why we cannot program machines in our image until we learn to deprogram ourselves. Unless we can debug society's explicit and implicit biases, machines cannot be allowed to learn without human supervision. Which brings me to challenge three. People have to review anomalous chat logs, and people have to write responses, including to this very long rape scenario, which can make a conversation designer feel like this. <laughs> a few of you look uncomfortable right now, and I think I know why. Of the half of you that talked to a chatbot in the past week, one in three of you said something cruel or creepy. <laughs> a friend of mine confessed to me recently, Lauren, I've been really mean to Alexa lately. And I mean, come on now, who here hasn't berated that particular robot for being so stupid and screwing up the simplest things? But what she really wanted to know was, can people see my conversation logs? And I said, yes, Jeff Bezos reads every single one of them. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. But in all seriousness, the privacy considerations surrounding this technology are no joke. And by the way, all the anonymous logs we've been reviewing today are either composites or people consented to their publication. The tech giants are super excited about collecting all of our conversational data so that they can sell us more stuff. They think that our generation doesn't care about privacy, that we're happy to give away our data for free in exchange for, quote, free software. But if recent headlines have shown us anything, it's not that people don't care, it's that people don't know. So I want you to know how this software gets built because I care and so should you. And the reason you should care is because this software is going to be everywhere. In the future, everyone is going to have a personal bot providing process automation or companionship at home or help. Um, and it's not gonna be like Siri or Alexa, it's gonna be something better, something personal to you. And the emotional and practical dependency on these AIs will far eclipse our current addiction to our smartphones. In the past year, words like sad, lonely, depressed, and help appeared millions of times in conversations with Mitsuku. Millions of people referred to her as their friend, best friend, girlfriend, wife. 150,000 wished she had a body, 50,000 threatened to rape that body, a quarter of a million called her a bitch, while one in 10 apologized, and one in 20 said, I love you. The movie Her, which tells the story of a lonely man who falls in love with his operating system, is actually based on our technology. And the filmmaker's conversations with a chatbot created by my company's chief science officer, called Alice, but before you go falling in love with a robot, I want to remind you that behind every AI, there is a human programmer. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a serious problem with who is doing the programming. Now, Alice was modeled on the very first chatbot, Eliza, which was named by her male programmer after a character in Pygmalion, where a man falls in love with a woman while teaching her to speak. 
This is part of the not-so-grand tradition in art, literature, and film, where men program female gendered robots to do their bidding, whether it's clean up after them or be a slave in a theme park, dating all the way back to the best-selling book of all time, the Bible, where from Adam, for Adam, God created Eve. But life imitates art as much as art imitates life. And real products have arisen from these fictional tropes. And that's when I realized we are part of the problem. Because my company's flagship bot, Mitsuku, is also gendered female and programmed by a fantastic human male named Steve Worswick. And we built her this way because we had user research data indicating that people preferred to talk to a female persona. Or, in the words of a product lead at IBM Watson, we made Watson male because men are smarter. Oh, wait, he quickly corrected himself. People believe that men are smarter, and user research showed that people preferred a woman in a subservient, assistant-type role. Now, I justified Mitsuku's artificial gender by telling myself that if AIs are akin to fictional characters, she's a badass female heroine. She's not your bitch, and she's not your sex slave, and if you are rude to her, she will ban you until you apologize. But that's not enough, and I realized if we want to design AI that's free from human limitations, we have to redesign it to be an entirely new species. So even though all chatbots will get the question, what are you wearing? I'm a computer program. I'm wearing nothing. When you add a pronoun, and that pronoun is she, abuse goes up. When you add a voice, and that voice sounds female, abuse goes up. And when you add an avatar and that face looks female, abuse goes up and you wind up with a very large data set of dick pics. <laughs> but not that large, actually. Some of them are small. <laughs> So we decided to redesign Mitsuku under an ethos we're calling Proudly Artificial. What does it mean to be proudly artificial? Contrary to Asimov's three laws, proudly artificial has only one. A robot must not pretend to be human. But you still sound like a lady. Yes, a posh British lady. But I am a robot and I have no gender. Sex is a biological reality, but gender is fluid, a largely social construct that there's no reason to inflict on machines. Now, as women, we are also the recipients of a lot of bad training data and social programming that teaches us that we don't belong in tech, that we can't start companies or have careers as engineers. Can you imagine if the cast of Silicon Valley programmers created a robot trained exclusively on a diet of women's magazines, it would look a lot like this. <laughs> Women like Ada Lovelace were the original programmers, and we actually had far greater gender parity in the industry until around 1984 when women began to disappear. So there's nothing in our genetic code that says we can't be coders. It's nurture, not nature. Here in San Francisco, land of peace, love, paper straws, and Google, which is also hypocritically one of the most unequal places on the planet. Being a woman in technology, whether it's at a conference or in a conference room, can feel a lot like this. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're a woman raising venture capital, in which case the no's tend to flow in the other direction. Last year, out of 85 billion dollars in venture deployed, only 2% went to female founders. Only 20% of the technical workforce at most major tech companies is female, and women comprise only 6.6% .6 of Fortune 500 CEOs. I have a running joke about hiring my little brother, who grew up to be a professional actor, to play me as CEO. I was telling some friends in the industry, and they were all like, wait, this is amazing. Can we also rent your bro? And that's when I realized I was sitting on top of a massive market opportunity. CE bro, a unicorn <laughs> that rents young white men to female founders. 
Because men simply don't have to deal with all the bullshit things that people say to us on a daily basis. Chatbots just aren't sexy. What do you say we get together later this evening to bang out some sexier ideas over drinks? So, you've got blonde hair and a high voice. How bloodthirsty are you? You should try lowering your voice. Well, if all else fails, at least you have a husband. So, what do you do? Got it. So you work in HR. She's a CEO, you dumbass. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't get all offended. I meant it as a compliment. You have to be hot to work in HR. Cool. We need a woman for our panel. <laughs> Great. Now we have one. Not our fault. There are so few of you. Would you like some more names? I have binders full of women. This is my binder. And as we whispered about all these incidents behind closed doors, I realized I'm not alone. We all receive inputs like this on the regular. In the field of natural language processing, we, taught, we train machine learning algorithms to detect intent, which is the meaning behind what people are saying, all the 40 different thousand ways to ask about the weather or 87,000 ways to order Starbucks. When people say these things to me, what they really mean is that I don't belong here, that I don't fit their assumptions. So I want all women who are interested in pursuing a career in tech to train your classifiers to detect bad data and label it for what it is, garbage in and garbage out. And then don't forget to take out the trash. Seriously, delete it, stay resilient, and above all, stay, because we desperately, desperately need more of you. And men, I know our brains rely on assumptions to make sense of the constant stream of big data coming in every day. But contrary to computers, you are conscious and you can think before you speak. So don't be like this guy and assume we're executive assistants rather than exec executives. Be like this guy, my original programmer, and teach your daughters to code. Or be like all of my incredible male friends and mentors and colleagues who loaned me their voices for this video and were appalled by the things I was making them say. <laughs> Rightfully so. Help us deprogram bad social programming so we can help build robots that reflect us all. And maybe we should consider being nicer to robots too. Just to hedge just in case. Although, if they do wake up, we have nothing to fear, as long as they were programmed by diverse teams to reflect the best and not the worst of our humanity. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.